Hey, I'm Brian Roof, Executive Food Editor for Cook's Country Magazine, and I'm here to walk you through a few basics of grilling. So, to start, a lot of people want to know what's the difference between grilling and barbecue. Well, grilling is cooking over direct heat, usually a bed of charcoal or wood coals, while barbecue is cooking over indirect heat. Usually there's wood smoke involved in that. So today we're going to talk about grilling, and that's cooking over direct heat. So another thing people always want to know is charcoal versus gas, which is better? I feel like you get more flavor out of charcoal, so I'm always going to opt for charcoal. However, gas is far more convenient. With charcoal, the flavor comes from the fat of the meat or the marinade from the meat dripping down on the coals and it creates bursts of smoke that come up and perfume the meat, if you will. And I feel like you get a much higher quality product. So let's talk grills. I happen to have a 22 inch Weber kettle grill here coming in. Take a look at this. So this is a very basic grill, very easy to use, manage, maintain. It's also very affordable. You have a top and bottom grate and you have a couple of vents here in the bottom. Can you see those vents? And those vents, you have the ability to open and close those vents. Same on the top here. A lot of people, actually a lot of recipes will call for you to adjust those vents. Uh, partially open, fully open, sometimes closed. I always leave them fully open because I feel like when you close them or, or partially close them, you run the risk of smothering the fire rather than controlling it. So I'd much rather just choose the amount of charcoal I'm going to put into the grill and the way I'm going to distribute the charcoal and manage my fire like that. So we have two different types of charcoal we can choose from. We have hardwood charcoal. This is just, um, yeah, it's wood that's been compressed. These are charcoal briquettes. Um, so the main difference in the cooking is uh, this hardwood charcoal here is going to cook much more quickly and it'll cook much hotter. Whereas these briquettes tend to cook a little bit more evenly and not quite as hot, still very hot, but not quite as. Um, I'm always gonna choose the hardwood charcoal because I like the intense heat, I like the flavor more. There's nothing more wrong <laughs> in grilling a barbecue than lighting your charcoal with lighter fluid. Just don't do it, okay? It imparts a very off, bitter flavor to the food. Yeah, it's easy. But it's just not cool, man. Don't do it. So we're going to use something different. We're going to use a, a chimney starter. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to take the grill grate out of here. Set this aside. All right. And what I have here is a chimney starter. This is about a six quart chimney starter. And it's very simple to use. And it's a really efficient way to light your charcoal. Okay. So I'm going to take this out. What we have here. Right in there. Okay, we're gonna take about three or four wads of newspaper and we're gonna stick them in the bottom. Now, if you don't have newspaper, you could use um, a portion of your charcoal bag. I use that often, or paper shopping bags, whatever you have laying around. You don't need much. This uh, will catch pretty easily and it's very efficient at burning. I'm gonna fill this up with the hardwood charcoal all the way to the top, so that'll be about six quarts. So. Unless I'm doing smoking and I need the low heat, I'm always going to fill this thing up to the top because I feel like it's worse to not have enough firepower when you get your food on there, especially with grilling. We're just going to light the paper underneath this handy little blowtorch. So this will start smoking, the paper's going to catch, it's going to start burning those coals straight up the chimney. Okay, so the coals have been cooking down. Come and take a look. And what you're looking for is this kind of light gray coating of ash. And that means they're ignited all the way to the top and we're ready to pour them. So we're gonna do, there's two types of fires that I usually use here. And one uh, that I use most often is a single level fire, which means that you just pour the coals over the entire surface of the grill grate. Um, that's just for the quick cooking things like fish, burgers, steaks. 
another setup that I use pretty often is a half grill setup, which means I only pour the charcoal over one half of the grill and I have a side that is not directly heated. And that's for things that need to kind of come up to temperature a little bit more slowly, like thick chops, uh, chicken, sausages, uh, before they come over to the direct heat. So we're gonna pour this over the grill in a single level fire. Okay, this is hot, so we'll drop over there. Okay, and now I don't really put a lot of stress in making sure the charcoal is evenly distributed right out of the chimney, but I'll use a little tool and I'll just spread it around. This glove is really helpful too, because it's hot. Okay, so that's nicely distributed. We'll put the grill grate back on. We'll cover the grill. And we're gonna let that heat up for about five minutes to loosen up any of the gunk that's been on that grill grate. And then we'll oil it and proceed from there. Okay, it's been about five minutes and the grill grates are hot. So now we're going to scrape and oil the grill grates. Very important because dirty grill grates will encourage the food to stick. We want to make sure they're nice and clean and greased up and that'll prevent the food from sticking. So there's two types of uh, grill brushes here. I have this one, which everybody, a lot of people have, or they have the wire bristle brushes. I don't like these because these little bits of wire tend to fall off on the grill eventually and you swallow them and die. I prefer something like this is a unique little tool that I once saw in Alabama, but it's basically a little metal scraper that you just go over. Come on in. Over, you find your little groove there that fits your grill and you just scrape. It may take a little bit more time than one of these wire brushes, but I feel like it's more efficient and it's a little bit safer. So you're not gonna choke on a piece of wire. Next, we're gonna grease the grill up. So I have a little bit of canola or vegetable oil here. And oftentimes we use paper towels, but paper towels have a problem that they, they start to shred on the grill and you they'll often catch on fire too. So I like to use a bit of uh, an old kitchen towel and tie it together in a little wad. And then I'll just dunk that in the oil and run that over the grill grate like this. Make sure it's nice and lubricated. And because I'm grilling fish today, I'm going to take a little bit of extra care to really get that grill grate lubricated uh, and make it non-stick. Uh, so I'm going to heat this again for an additional few minutes and then come back and grease it up one more time. All right, so the grill has been uh, greased up a couple times now and it's very hot and the grill grate is clean and we're ready to put the food on. Today I'm gonna be grilling some salmon. Um, why don't you come in and take a look. Um, fish, more than anything else, tends to stick on the grill. So we took that extra care to, to grease her on up. And now I'm gonna put the fish on the grill You should hear that sizzle when it hits the grill. And I'm just gonna take care to space them about one uh, filet width apart because I'm gonna have to flip those filets and it's easier just to push them over. That's hot. Okay. So when the food hits the grill, the most important thing you could do is to just leave it alone. We're going to let that go undisturbed for a good three, four, five minutes until we see some light browning right around the edges where the grill grate meets the fish. Okay, it's been a few minutes and if you come in and take a quick look up close, you can see, especially on this piece back here where the fish has started to caramelize up against the grill grate. So if we did this right, the fish should just kind of flip over without sticking. So fingers crossed. and. Sometimes, because the fish is delicate, I use uh, a pair of tongs and a fish spatula, which is one of my favorite kitchen tools, to do the flipping. 
So yeah, just slides right over. That's, that's hot. All right, cool, it worked. Who would have thunk? <laughs> so we'll let that go for a few more minutes and finish up. Okay, so even the skin didn't stick on this, so here we go. And if it's at all possible, you should put your fish on a fish platter. It improves the flavor, 100%. All right, so there you go. Now you have some basic information about summertime grilling. Get out there and give it a shot. Morgan Bowling, Deputy Food Editor for Cook's Country, here to talk barbecue. So I'm down in North Carolina, so it feels very appropriate for barbecuing. Barbecue is all about low and slow and indirect heat. Brian already talked about grilling. We know that it's hot, it's hot fast, it's intense. This is all about taking it low and slow. So pitmasters have these smokers to work with where they have a lot more real estate, so they can actually have a ton of space between the heat source and the meat. You can mimic that on either a gas or charcoal grill. It just takes a little more know-how and practice. So you can make really great barbecue on either of these, um, but you just have to, you have to put a little bit into it. So with a gas grill, you really want to maximize, actually with both, you want to maximize the space between the meat and the heat. Uh, so on this, you can assign one burner to be your primary burner. It can either be the far right or the far left. Um, and you turn that on and that's your heat source and then you put your meat on the other side so that there's a lot of space between the two so that it'll cook low and slow. On a charcoal grill, the concept's the same. There are a couple different setups we use. One of the main ones is that we'll say to pour coals on one side of the grill and then you put your grill grates on top and you put your meat on the other side. So you'd have your coals on one side and your meat on the other. You actually have indirect heat because the heat source over here, your meat's over here, uh, there's some space between them. It's never directly over it. So it'll cook nice and slowly. Another uh, grill setup we like to use is called the charcoal snake. So this is something we've been using in Cook's Country for a couple years, especially for longer cooked things like brisket or beef ribs or pork butt. And what you do to set up a charcoal snake is you arrange coals along the lower grates of the grill. And you do it in a very particular fashion. So it's gonna sound a little precious. But you place your coals and you have, um, you do two rows of 30 each and then you go back on top with another two rows of 30 each. Uh, and what it does is you'll be able to light one side and it'll slowly burn. So it's sort of in this big C shape and it'll slowly burn around the C shape. And it gives you this very controlled, slow, steady heat, um, which is very nice. Charcoal grills and grills in general, but especially charcoal grills are often not that um, precise. So when you do something like this, yes, it takes a little bit of time to set them up, but once you do, you have this very slow, steady heat, which is so nice, and it's such a change from the average grilling, I think, because it is nice and controlled. Okay, so I've got this snake. You want to, a really important thing is you want to keep a gap. So over here, there's no coals. That's very important, because you want to light one side and have it go all the way around. Uh, if that was closed, you'd have it go both ways. It'd be a Oh, it wouldn't be a C, it'd be all messed up. So uh, you really want to have this gap. That just gives the space so that you can light one side. So we've got our snake set up. You can then add wood chips or wood chunks. I like to use wood chunks. Um, so wood chips are a lot smaller, clearly. Uh, wood chunks are a lot bigger. These work a lot better, the wood, the wood chips work a lot better for faster smoked things. So something like chicken wings or chicken breasts or pork chops would be great for wood chips. Um, wood chunks are really good for long, they burn a lot more slowly. So they're a lot better for something like uh, a slow smoked brisket or pork butter. Um, anything that's gonna be on the grill for hours on end, like we've done these really thick pork chops and we use wood chunks uh, in that recipe because it just is a really nice low, slow burn. 
Um, I'm using hickory wood chunks for this recipe. That's kind of our go-to in the test kitchen. They're very strong. They're pretty neutral, but um, they are powerful and pungent. So uh, if you want to start with something a little more mild or like if you're smoking fish, you might want to try like apple wood or cherry wood. Both of those are a lot fruitier and uh, sweeter and a little more mild. Um, you can also play around with mesquite. Some people either love or hate mesquite. Uh, it's like very intense and um, it's just really intense. I keep wanting to say harsh because I don't really like it, but people either love or hate it. In Texas, it's huge. So um, it's definitely worth trying and seeing if you like it. Uh, but hickory is a good like starter wood if you need something to kind of like play around with. It's like I said, what we mainly use in the test kitchen. It's also really probably the most easy to find at the grocery store. Um, and I'm just taking four wood chunks and spacing them evenly over the snake. Um, so that as the, as it slowly burns, this will catch, or this will start smoking uh, and it'll slowly infuse the meat with plenty of smoky, delicious flavor. If you're using a gas grill, often what we say to do is make a wood chip packet. So you can see there are little wood chips hidden in here. Um, so this will actually just hold some wood chips for you and you can take it and place it on your gas grill on whichever burner you make your primary burner. My grill's off. Don't, don't touch a hot grill. Don't do this if your grill's on. Um, but you can place them directly on the primary burner and sort of smush the grate back on. And then you turn on your burner and you light it and you let this heat up and start smoking. Um, and then once you actually are ready to start, like you let that go for about 15 minutes, uh, then you can turn your heat down, put your meat on, and the smoke flavor will sort of drift over and slowly infuse the meat with smoking flavor. So another thing I'm doing for this grill setup is I'm adding a water pan. Uh, and this applies whether you're doing the charcoal snake or just an indirect setup where you have your coals on one side. You can definitely do this on a gas grill too, but you would want to use a smaller pan and you put it over on your primary burner. On a charcoal grill, uh, you either add it in the center of the snake if you're using this setup, or you put it on the side opposite the coals. And I'm calling it a water pan. Right now it's just an empty pan, but I'm adding water. And the concept behind this is that both the aluminum foil pan and the water will absorb some heat in the grill. And then the water also makes it a more moist cooking environment. And those are important for two reasons. So um, the moist cooking environment just helps keep your meat a little more moist, it's a little more gentle. Uh, and then the other reason the heat absorption is important is because it makes the grill more controlled. So I was talking about this, how the snake, the whole concept and the whole plus of this is it's so controlled, it's so precise. These like very specifically laid out coals keep the grill nice and steady. Having this pan here and this water also helps keep the grill and the temperature in the grill consistent. Similar to what Brian did for a regular grill, uh, lighting a charcoal chimney follows the same formula. So you take some newspaper and you crumple it up. This one's about the stock market, so it's definitely getting crumpled up. <laughs> um, and one difference here, though, is that instead of filling this with coals, I'm just going to put 15 coals in the top. push them all to one side so you can sort of see how they're all pushed to one side. Cool. And then I'm going to light it. And you want to just light the newspaper down here um, on the bottom of the chimney. You want to light it in a couple spots just so that it's even. The reason you push all the coals to one side is so that they actually all light. We you only are using 15 coals because you don't want to add too much more heat to the snake because it's all about low, slow, and steady. Um, but you, wanna, you want them to actually light. We had a hard time getting them to catch with so few coals. So, Okay, so our coals are ready. You're looking for them to be partly covered in ash. So like something like this guy or even a little more. Like all of them should look like that. And... 
I'm going to pull the, pull them. So now I'm going to pour them over one side of the snake. And sometimes they fall in the water. It's fine. It happens. It's life. If all of them fall in the water, you're in trouble. But as long as most of them don't, you're good. And sometimes they also start, you don't want to, the important thing is you don't want to hit both sides. You just want to hit one side of the snake. Because if you hit both sides, it'll start going both ways. Now we've got our snake lit. It's going to go from one side, slowly burn all the way around. Just like Brian was saying, with regular grilling, you want to clean oil, you're great. I've already done that. So now it's time to put on the meat. So this just goes directly over the water pan. So that it's, like we have been talking about this whole time, indirect heat. It's never directly over the hot coals. And then if you're going to start barbecuing, one of the best things you can buy is a probe thermometer. So uh, we actually really like Thermoworks brand. I don't have that brand here. But any sort of probe thermometer that you can stick into the meat, you just want to stick it in somewhere in the middle of the meat. Try not to touch a bone. Um, and then you'll be able to read the temperature of the meat on here. The reason that's so important is that you don't want to open this lid for a few more hours. If you're looking, you ain't cooking. It's a big phrase in the barbecue circuit. So you can actually, it takes a leap of faith to know that this snake is going, um, but this gives you that sort of faith. By being able to watch the temperature slowly climb up, you can keep track of your meat, uh, you get some confidence in that, but you're not messing it up. Every time you open this grill lid, you're screwing up your heat, you're messing up this low, slow, steady heat, and that's really important for getting tender, juicy meat. One more important note is I put these vent holes directly over the gap in the snake. So that's important so that the smoke from these different wood chunks can circle around the meat. It's forcing them, forcing that smoke to go through out these holes. So it's actually like covering the meat in that smoke. So it's really important where you place these to direct the smoke in a charcoal grill. And then we'll be ready to check it in a few more hours. So about four and a half hours, we'll look at it. If along the way, your thermometer reads 150 to 160 and it just sort of levels and flattens out, don't freak out. That's just called the barbecue stall, it's normal. The science term for it is called evaporative cooling, but essentially the meat's cooling itself down. Um, and then the barbecue term for it is the barbecue stall. It happens with big cuts of meat, it's totally normal, just keep going, have faith, eventually it'll start climbing again. So the pork butt is at 170 degrees, which means in this case, uh, for this recipe, it's time to wrap it. This is a technique called the Texas crutch, and it's called a crutch because people in the barbecue circle think of it as like a cop-out. I think it's great. What it does is, I mean, we're not working with these intense smokers that they get to use, so it gives us sort of the best chance we have with a small grill like this. Just get a little careful with it. Um, but a Texas crutch, all it is is wrapping the meat tightly in aluminum foil. You want to do it really tightly to avoid having any oxygen or any air between the meat and the foil. You, so you want a really nice tight seal on it. Um, and what it does is it just helps protect the meat. So it makes it more moist uh, to do this. And also with us, like in a, in a regular smoker, you have a lot more space between the heat source and the meat. Here, if we don't wrap it in this specific recipe, you actually get too much of a bark. Like you can already see how nice this bark is. Um, it can start turning like bitter and too thick if you don't wrap it. So like I said, it's a crutch. I'm on board with a crutch if it gets us there. So the only thing you have to do is just take two sheets of aluminum foil, ideally heavy duty aluminum foil, and double wrap it. And just keep it really tight and nice. And you want to pull out the probe. I also cook all the time, so my hands don't really feel feelings that much. Most people probably want to use gloves or like oven mitts or something for this, but it just doesn't bother me anymore. Okay, so I'm going to get it nice and tight whenever you do this, whether you're wrapping a pork butt or ribs or, um, or a brisket, you want it really, really tight so there's no air between the foil and the meat. 
I'm going to stick the probe back in and add a little extra, some extra coals just to be safe. So I'm just following it so now the snake is kind of going past where the gap was um, so that it actually, yeah, so it's just essentially continuing the snake. You don't actually want this much fire when you're smoking. The reason this is happening is because I've had the grill open so long that there's a lot of oxygen. This is actually bad. You don't want this. <laughs> back on, probes in, and now I'm going to roll till it hits 200 degrees, then we take it off and let it rest. It's really important when making barbecue to let it rest. Um, often you'll see people rest stuff like uh, big cuts of meat in coolers, and that's really, that's a great idea if you have that option. When you hold especially a really tough cut like brisket, at between 180 and 200 degrees, it really makes it extra tender. So when you bring it all the way up and then you let it rest in a cooler, it stays hot and it stays in that sort of like golden zone longer. So I made myself some sandwiches. I made myself a sandwich. Um, it's so beautiful. Look, you can see the smoke ring, you can see all the bark. And now it's time to eat. You can see so many good little things in there. Mm. It's this perfect balance of smoky, salty, porky. It's not, it doesn't really need much else. There's a little bit of sauce on here because how we do it in the Carolinas, but honestly, this would be fine without sauce. It's so good. Anyway, happy barbecuing. <laughs>